So welcome to the session on the introduction to ART and Larsoft. ART is our uh, event processing framework, where the word event means in Dune speak trigger record. It's the smallest amount of data that the framework can process. If you guys are collider people, um, we always refer to run and event numbers where you trigger a detector and read it out and that data is called an event, even if it had several interactions on it. So ART uses that terminology and it uh, is a software um, framework that we use to organize our code and our access to the data. And uh, it provides a lot of features for the uh, collaboration because we have over a thousand collaborators and many of them are active software developers. In fact, at the moment, because Dune is so new, um, to analyze data is essentially to develop software because there isn't that much uh, software now. And if you want to do something, you probably have to write some software for it. And writing software is uh, uh, a job that sometimes steps on other people's toes unless your environment and system is set up so that you can isolate your work from everyone else's work and also manage to contribute your work. Say, if you calibrate something, you want everyone else to benefit from your calibration, but people need to know whether your calibration has been applied or not. So ART handles all of these sorts of things. It defines the event loop. It manages uh, event data storage. Uh, it uh, is the input file interface. If you have many files you want to run over, ART lets you um, specify how to do that easily. Uh, it schedules uh, code execution within an ART job, uh, defines a standard way to store data in uh, root files so that they can be accessed easily. And there are associations between data products. We won't get into that um, right away, though. I think one of the examples shows how to search for example code for digging up um, uh, associations. Uh, there's a job configuration interface called Fickle, which we'll talk about later. And uh, that's one thing that is most people's uh, uh, big interface with art is how to configure your job. So it's important to learn how to use Fickle, or at least how to copy some other Fickle file and, and modify it. Um, an interesting feature of art is that the configuration of a job is stored in the output file. So that means that if you get a file from someone or read it off of tape or the file was written years ago and no one wrote a wiki page or sent you an email or documented it in some way, the file contains enough information so that you can tell where it came from and how it was made. And not everyone uh, thinks ahead to do that in standalone code. So one of the first question uh, posed in the uh, top here is why do we use a framework and not just write our own code? And a lot of these things have to do with uh, just being nice to your collaborators. So if you want to make a data file that everyone can use, it's important to document it and ART will automatically uh, put uh, extra information into files so that uh, people can figure out where they came from and what's in them. Uh, output file control, you can steer the output file names based on the input file and parts of the input file name and things that are computed within the job. Message handling is an interesting uh, uh, issue if you just have a bunch of print statements. In fact, if you have a thousand collaborators and each one puts a print statement in the job, your uh, job will have more error messages and print statements than it has actual output. So the message handling lets you steer and control that and bring that under control. Random numbers are uh, an important uh, ingredient for Monte Carlo processing, and you should switch them off for data. We should never throw random numbers in data processing. But controlling random numbers in Monte Carlo is important so that you can reproduce a uh, job that has run on the grid interactively for debugging things and get the same answer back. And it's important so that your diff different jobs on the grid produce different output and you're not just running the same events over and over and over again and exception handling. So um, we can get ourselves set up to try things out. I'm just going to log into one of the Dune GPVM machines, and then I'm going to cut and paste this. I assume you still have your setup script from the first, um, oops, 
Uhr ist die. Hm. Oh, that's the problem. Is I didn't call it dot. I just said that. There's that and set up doing TPC. I misnamed my script when I did this. I actually have an alias to do all this. Okay, so what this does is it sets up the environment and I can see which UPS products I have set up. I, it's very long, so I will pipe it through grep. So I want to know, say, what version of root I'm running. And I'm running root version 6.22.06a, here four. And Dune TPC should be um, this version that we had set up uh, version uh, before in the um, uh, setup uh, session. Dune TPC is 9.22. And the list of all Dune TPC versions in CVMFS is this. And there are many, many. So I have to warn you, these uh, version lists, um, this version list is not sorted. It may look sorted, but it's not. And uh, you may uh, have to dig through the whole thing to find things that you want. There are different versions. This is called the version tag 9.22.01. We cut a version of Dune TPC for every version of Larsoft, and Larsoft releases every week. So you'll see a lot of versions on this list. This is called the flavor, and Linux plus three is SL7. We used to support SL6, but we don't anymore. And these qualifiers, uh, E19 means the GCC compiler. E20 is a newer one, but I don't see it on the list yet. C7 is the client compiler. Um, we have other qualifiers, debug and prof, when you set up a release, um, you have to specify whether it's the debug or the prof and which compiler. And the qualifiers are separated by colons, and it doesn't matter which one you specify first. So these qualifiers can be in any order, but they have to be uh, separated by colons. So debug and prof, what they mean is that profile is compiled with optimization turned on and not specifically for profiling. It's a historical. Uh, name for, I think, 03. It's the third level of optimization turned on in the compiler. Debug is compiled with optimization turned off. Um, but both uh, builds have debug symbols uh, turned on. So you can actually run the debugger with either one of those. And you can run things like Valgrind um, and profiling tools with either one. It's just that the debug version will run about four times slower than the prof one. and uh, things may be confusing in the debugger because various things get shuffled out of order and variables get put into registers. So when we did a setup, we executed this command. It's in the UPS product. Um, U UPS stands for Unix product setup, and it runs the setup to set up the environment. If you didn't do this um, Dune setup, command here, which is sourcing the CVMFS setup, what you'll get is if you execute the um, a setup command, is you'll get the system setup and it will ask you for the root password. And don't do that. Just go back and execute this setup uh, first and try again. OK. And we already went through the UPS active to see what we have set up. Turns out that um, the uh, whole calls, uh, the whole uh, dependency tree Maybe I should show it to you. Let's see if I actually have that. There it is. So here is the stack of stuff. We set up Dune TPC 9.22.02. And what UPS will do is it will set up all of these other products because Dune TPC is only some of the code. And things like root and Jant and art and Larsoft 
Tom? are things that Dune TPC depends on. And when you set up a version of Dune TPC, you get up the corresponding versions of everything else. So um, that one thing that uh, Dune TPC or uh, uh, UPS does for you, that's very nice. Okay, so Art has some handy com command line tools. And uh, one of them is to uh, uh, dump the configuration. I've mentioned that the job configuration, which switches you throw to um, run your job, say, what is the temperature of liquid argon that you're assuming in, in processing, is something that's an input parameter for the job configuration that gets written into uh, the output file. Config dumper dash, dash help. And generally, options that have more than one character in them have two dashes. This is not true for every command, but it is mostly true for the art uh, commands. If you've got one letter, it's usually just one hyphen, one dash, like this dash P. Turns out that P is the important option here. It's uh, for um, the uh, entire processing um, uh, configuration. If you don't specify config dumper dash P, you'll get a limited a uh, set of configuration, it will be missing the art services configuration. So I will try this out by cutting and pasting from the web. And what it will do is it will print out the entire fickle configuration for this particular root art root file that I got. Uh, and the storage quiz of said, said of course, use the X root D uh, uh, streaming feature, and that's what I'm doing, even for running config dumper. So this file exists in tape-backed dcache, and it's been staged. I had checked it before, and we staged it before this tutorial. And then we can dump the configuration. Let's do that into a uh, text file, and let's edit it. Now here's a little bit of a trick. If you're not running VNC, which is a better way to do X window connections, and all you have is a text terminal like I have here, you can um, send X connections back. I'm running on a Mac and I have X quartz uh, on here, but X is really slow by itself over a network and I'm at home. So if I were to run Emacs without the minus NW, which means no windows, that says don't fire up a separate window, just use Emacs in the text window. It's much quicker than it is to use the X window uh, interface to Emacs. So use Emacs minus NW when you're running in a text terminal. So I tried that out to a temporary file. Oh, I sent it to temp.txt instead of temp.fickle. This is actually a fickle file um, uh, formatted that you can use as input to another run of, of, of art. Uh, you may have to strip off the uh, uh, explanation right at the beginning. These should be uh, comments. And it says where it got the uh, configuration from. So there's a quiz about what to, some questions that we can answer by looking at this. Should I just go ahead and find the answers in this configuration, show people what the answers are? Sure. Yep. Feel free, participants, to uh, react on the chat and say if you follow, if it is okay. We we need a bit some feedback, so uh, happy to get the thumbs up or thumbs down or just just that everything is alright. I'm not uh, sure I can see the chat, so you cannot. I don't. I will notify you actually uh, uh, if uh, if there is something on the chat. And right now, on the introduction to Larsoft in the live doc, which I share on the chat, I do not see anything. So so far, so good. Okay. So I'll go ahead and find the answers to this quiz in this uh, configuration dumper. So you may be curious as to what's in this root file that I dumped the configuration for. And one question is, what physics processes are simulated in this? This is a Monte Carlo file. So I'm going to search for the word generator in the uh, output. So I've got a random number generator control. That's not what I want. I want physics generators. So there's another random number thing. So this is an input label for a um, uh, Jean step. And that's not what I want. It's more random number generator stuff. There we, uh, we are. This says that the optical hit 
of finder uses generator input. I don't want that. Pandora reads things in from the generator. There's random number. Cosmic generator. There we are. So you may have to dig through some of this configuration to find what you want. And it looks like we're, we have some cosmic rays in here. I'm going to keep on looking for cosmic uh, generators. Now, here's a module whose label is generator. And this has things like beam in it. Now, beam cosmics don't have beams. So I think that this is actually a beam simulation uh, that was run. And this is a protodune. Uh, uh, I think it's 1GV protodune. Uh, sample. So this generator module here is simulating the protodune beam. So that's got a data-driven beam 1GV uh, input uh, flux file. So that is more input to another module that wants the output of the generator. And here is the trigger path. And you can read the art documentation to see what trigger path is. It's the list of modules to actually run. And these are text strings that are assigned to each module. And oh. this, yes? Yeah, there is a question that perhaps would uh, be uh, relevant to ask right now. Someone is asking, what is exactly a generator? Oh, OK. So in particle physics software, we usually have um, three or four, four steps. So the generator is the thing that simulates the physics process of interest. Uh, uh, like uh, collisions or the beam or cosmic rays, or in this case, argon-39 radiologicals. And then we run JAON, um, which simulates the interactions of the particles that the generator uh, produces in the detector. So uh, liquid argon is very dense, and it has a lot of interactions with scatters and showers and decays. All that is done by JAON. And then we simulate the detector. We have a de detector simulation stage and then a reconstruction stage. So the generator part is mostly just the physics. So this generator is actually the beam generator. And we probably should have labeled it beam instead of just generator. But it probably is historical because we started with just the beam generator and didn't and added these things to it and had to give them different names. So we've got beam, we've got cosmic rays, and we've got various kinds of radiological, sargon-39, argon-42, krypton-85, and radon-222. So that answers the first question, which generators are used. Geometry says, look for GDML, uh, geometry uh, definition markup language, GDML. Protodune, B7, that's the answer to that question. What is the electron lifetime? So I'm going to look for lifetime. There it is, 35, and that's in milliseconds. And here's another 35 in microseconds. In fact, this is uh, sometimes you may find some um, uh, inconsistencies if the same parameter has to be put in more than once. They have to match. So the fourth question here is, what is the readout window size? And it's 6,000 ticks, 6,000 samples. We read out the TPC uh, once every half of a microsecond. So it's 500 nanoseconds between ADC samples, and 6,000 of them in a row is one trigger record. And then someone put this in twice. They've got some bits of code uses the parameter number time samples, and some other bits of code uses readout window size, that's because people didn't talk to one another and they defined the parameter twice. You have to set it to be uh, the same thing. And it looked like the lifetime may have gone in there twice too. Maybe once for simulation, once for reconstruction. Some, someone is uh, asking, uh, how do we know the unit of these numbers? Um, well, the fickle configurations that are in the repositories should have the full configuration for the software. So whenever anyone writes software that needs a particular configuration, they should supply a default fickle file. Um, there are ways to check so that if you run a job and don't specify something, then the job can crash. So uh, you will be <laughs> uh, pointed out if, if someone is bothering to check. Usually what people do is they supply default values, and the default values should uh, go into the job configuration. And there are a lot of things. OK, there's that. So this is get the configuration from uh, an art root file. 
There's also fickle dump, which um, takes a input fickle file and uh, processes it, takes all the includes and uh, dumps the output to uh, the screen. And I can write that to um, a text file and edit it just like I did with the uh, output from the uh, data file. So uh, fickle files are found with fickle by searching in fickle file path, which is a colon separated list of directories. The first one is the current working directory. That's what dot is. And looks like dot appears a few times. So what fickle dump will do, and in fact, uh, Larsoft jobs, is it will look for the fickle file that you specify in this search path, looking in the first directory first and then going down the search path. And when you set up your environment and all those UPS products, each one that has a fickle file path uh, addition is added to this list in a consistent order. Count events, just counts the events. We'll try it out, not too hard. It actually gives you more counts than are useful. So I think this is the number of runs and sub runs. Now you ask to count events. This third number is actually the number of events. So this file has 10 events and data files tend to have more events than Monte Carlo files because Monte Carlo files take a long time to run on grid jobs. And then we split up grid jobs into smaller numbers of events to get them, uh, get them processed properly. Okay. Another command line tool is product sizes dumper. So this Monte Carlo file that we were looking at the configuration, we can look at the contents. And let's pipe that to another text file. And let's look and see what's in this uh, file. So there are several trees in this, um, root trees in this file. And the one that you'll be interested in is called events. And the event data has all these data products in it that are defined in Larsoft. Um, we share a lot of code with other experiments and these data products have been defined over the years. There are things like raw digits, there are um, MC particles from the um, from the Jeon step. There's MC truth from the generator step, and uh, all kinds of things in uh, raw Rico and analysis. So the question is, what's in this file? What what are the biggest space users? What's taking up all the space in the in the file? And this is sorted by size. So the first item on the list is MC particles. And you'll notice that this is a running feature of Dune um, Monte Carlo, is that the biggest item in the files are the Monte Carlo particle list. And that's because uh, trajectory points are saved in the Monte, Monte Carlo particles. So when the cosmic ray goes through, uh, you'll get trajectory points everywhere along the track and, uh, Monte, and uh, electromagnetic showers make lots of particles too. The back tracker is another thing that uses uh, Monte Carlo truth, and that scales with the size of Monte Carlo. So module label, these items, uh, the SIMB colon colon MC particles is the name of the data product. The S here is added by art. So MC particle is the name of the data product itself, and it's got a uh, namespace SIMB. The underscore separates the data product name from the module label. And then there's another underscore. And then there's an instance uh, name here, which is empty. So there is no instance string. It's the empty string. And the reason there's a module label called large aunt, and that's the answer to question two. Uh, the reason we need an instance in addition to the module label is because a module could produce two kinds of the same data product. It may produce uh, this kind of MC particle and that kind of MC particle. And if you want to do, be able to do that within the same module, you need to be able to specify which one is which, and that's done with the instance name. But it turns out that this module only made one kind of MC particle, so it left the instance name blank. So sometimes you have to count underscores. This has two underscores, and that means that the instance name is blank. How many um, 
Okay, that was question three. How many different modules produced MC Truth? Let's look for MC Truth. MC Truth. Um, there is an interesting question that will help everyone understand. Uh, what is uh, some MB and SIM? Does it mean simulation? Yeah. So the B in SIM B means SIM base. And I think this is an old convention from Brian Rabel is that anything that is shared by many other um, uh, software components has a base and a standard and, a, and various configuration options to it. But it turns out that almost everything is just base. So this is the simulation base. So um, turns out that the uh, MC particles are defined, I think, in new sim data. So LS new sim here. And there's an include new sim data. Simulation base, that is where the sim B comes from. And there is MC particle and MC truth. And we can have a look and see how this data product is defined by just editing it. Are we looking at MC particles? We're looking at MC particles. And we can see that this is in the namespace sim B, MC particles. So that's where sim B colon colon MC particle comes from. And these are all of the things that are inside MC particles. And you should find things like a MC particle trajectory, which is what's taking all the all the space, but there are things like the PDG code and yeah, PDG, constant PDG, PDG code. You can retrieve it with PDG code. FPDG code is where it's actually stored. Okay. Great. And I'm sharing the, the Monte Carlo particle numbering scheme on the chat right now. Mm -hmm. We can actually take a peek at some of these files. Maybe, do you want to look at these in a root browser or just go through the go through the product sizes dumper here? Yeah, actually, it says we can open up the file in root. I'm going to do that with um, V and C because it's too slow to do that. Oops. And there is a timeout on that. So one of the outputs for the exercises later um, is to make a uh, Monte Carlo event and reconstruct it. And I had already set myself up to look at that. So here is a Monte Carlo file that has one event in it that I generated and simulated. It's like a cooking show. You take things out of the oven that have already been baking there. So this is a little bit quicker on VNC. And then let's look at the MC particles. Do we have SIMB? And there isn't a really good way to search for this. Oh, there's MC truth. Uh, MC truth. Let's look at MC truth. And then you can navigate to the object. And then is there a PDG code? And you can just click on PDG code. And unfortunately, it's really big because nuclear um, nuclear uh, uh, things like the argon nucleus fragment um, has uh, numbers on the order of a million. So that will uh, set the scale if you just click on it. So the status should be one for things that are uh, track ID one. Are these all so daughters? No daughters. Maybe I should look at MC particles instead. It could be clusters with something that I was doing an exercise with before. So clusters, there's in hits. So a lot of these data products, even though they are defined as C++ classes within the Larsoft um, uh, uh, structure, you can browse in the root browser just by clicking on leaves. You, not everything is visible in the root browser, and sometimes you get dictionary not found. So don't be afraid of uh, too much. 
just go ahead and uh, browse away because a lot of things you can find without writing an art job just by opening up a art root file in, in, in root. Uh, the event numbers are actually in another tree. So things like the, um, oops, it's the, called the event auxiliary, uh, event auxiliary. Do we have event auxiliary? Event metadata runs. Event auxiliary, there is event auxiliary. So if you wanna know what the event ID numbers are, there it is. There's the event number and uh, there should be run and sub runs. So if you wanna know which events are in there, you would have to go into the event auxiliary um, part of the events tree. Okay. So you don't even have to run art in order to browse an art file. You just um, look at it and root. We did all that. Okay, so let's look at how to run uh, an art job. And the command is called lar, lar, and there's extensive help for it, which gives command line options. And I'll let you read that at your leisure. The most common command line options to lar are n events, uh, dash n for the number of events you want to process, and dash c for the configuration file, uh, fickle file that steers art. So turns out that the lar executable lives in CVMFS under the art directory. It actually doesn't have very much in it. So this is a very short um, 143 kilobyte executable. And its main job is to read the fickle file and then uh, process the fickle file and load up your software. So it's essentially an empty shell in which your software starts running. Um, Dash, uh, so the fickle file says which modules uh, you need to load up shared uh, libraries for. The end events, of course, if you don't um, want to process every event in an input file, you would uh, specify dash n, or if you're generating uh, n events, uh, you want to make sure that the job actually finishes, so you have to tell how many events to generate. If you don't specify dash n events, uh, it will process all the events in the input file, which doesn't make any sense if you're generating new events from nothing, uh, but it does make sense for subsequent processing after the generator stage. So all the simulation and reconstruction, you want to process everything that you have. You need to sometimes specify the output file, otherwise you get the default from whatever the fickle file uh, says. So uh, it's a good idea to rename all of your output files to be different. If you're running many, many uh, art jobs on different input files, you have to make sure that the output files all are uniquely named. A lot of these job configuration will set the output file name to be a derivative of the input file name so that it tacks on an extra string and say, well, we're gonna run reconstruction on something that's already been simulated. It'll take the simulated file name and append underscore rico dot root to it. Okay, so on to um, configuring the job. So uh, let's go to the place where I've been running these things. Tutorial test. So the uh, workflow, which is down below, um, uh, runs generation, simulation, reconstruction. And this is one of the steps is uh, the uh, Jayant step. And it turns out that the, um, well, so the, the exercise that I have here is to change a parameter. So we know how to use um, uh, uh, fickle dump. There's an alternative to this. Oh, why don't we go ahead and use fickle dump? Oops, I didn't copy that. So this is the fickle configuration uh, for a particular stage of the uh, simulation. 
as JN4 stage two. And one of the jobs later that we have is, is try it out. And I think that's, that's here. This is the entire workflow. And what I'm doing is I'm snipping out this particular part because I've already done the first step. So if you were to uh, execute generation simulation detector, um, gen simulation detector simulation reconstruction, you would have to go through all of these steps. And these steps are organized in production for the uh, uh, the full protodune uh, uh, analysis group. But in our case, we want to say, let's change a parameter for one of these stages, and what we would do is we would dump out the entire parameter set to find out where it is. And let's say we wanted to change the uh, box uh, model parameter uh, A in our simulation to change the amount of uh, ionization charge deposit. So the issue is, is that you have to find out where it is in the fickle configuration. So you search for it, mod box A. And then you need to find the block that it's in. And always go up in the text editor. It's in large E4 parameters is the block that contains this uh, parameter. And then I would see what block large E4 parameters in. It's in services. So services dot large E4 parameters dot mod box A is the name of the parameter. And there is my default value, it's 9.3 times 10 to the minus one. And let's say I wanted to change it to this new value. I would make my own fickle file. Let's call it my G4 stage two and fickle. And what I would do is I would include the standard one. And then I would poke just the value for the parameter I want to change. So this has all the parameters in the standard set, and we were just looking at them all. And let's say I want to run everything standard and just change one parameter. What Fickle does is it processes everything in this Fickle file, and it only has two lines, but the first one's a real doozy. It includes everything else, processes all that. And then if there's any overwriting of a parameter, the last line that defines a parameter is the one that gets used. So if you want to change a parameter and keep everything else the same, you put your change line at the end. So this is at the very end of all this uh, uh, parameter definition here from the include, and that just changes the one that we want. And then we would, um, oops, and then we would uh, run with this fickle file. And the exercise has changed the electric field as well. So what I would do is I would look for field, magnetic field, I don't want that. That's all zero for the far detector. Uh, call field params, I don't think I want that. Induction field params, these are actually part of the process. I want the simulation stage. So it's in the detector property service, which is also part of services, and that has the electric field. So here's the answer to this question is I would do services detector properties service E field. And in this case, E field is a vector of three numbers. Let's just copy that open. And I need the initial bracket. White space is irrelevant, except when it's in quotes. So these three numbers are in kilovolts per centimeter, and it was 4.867. And I wanted to change that to 500 volts per centimeter. So this is five half a kilovolt per centimeter. So that's the answer to that. You might ask what these other two numbers are. And these other two numbers are the fields between the 
uh, U and V and between V and collection. So I think we don't actually have the field between grid and U in this case, because I think we inherited all this from Microburn and they don't have a grid plane. So a little bit of argon between the grid and the U plane, I think we may not be simulating quite right uh, in this. And uh, hits do get um, simulated uh, badly when they happen right uh, inside the, uh, the wire planes. So that's actually on the to-do list. Now this field configuration is for the bulk of the drift volume, and these are just in little half centimeter um, strips inside the APAs. And there are three of those. Okay, and then what you would do to run this job is of course to run my G4 stage two instead of the uh, default uh, out of CVMFS. So just to, um, how much time do I have left? I'm 44. I've got, got plenty of time. So there are several kinds of uh, user code that uh, gets built in and run by art. And there are several things that you want to do uh, in your code uh, within the framework. One of them, of course, is to make uh, data products. So if you read in some data from a file, you want to run an algorithm on it, you have to put your output somewhere. And uh, if your output isn't uh, just a histogram that you use for your analysis, but rather some data that you want to communicate in, uh, say, a reconstruction step for your colleagues, then you produce the uh, data product once or as many times as you need per event. And then that uh, algorithm that you put in uh, is called by a producer module. So producer modules are ones that say that they are going to put uh, data products into the output uh, uh, event data store, and they call this method art event put. And we can look through examples for producer modules and see how uh, data products are put in, the, put in the event. I think there are examples below. I've got a uh, inspection copy. One of the exercises or things that you should do is check out the code and make a, an inspection copy. And I put it in a directory called inspect. And let's see. So what? That might be a little bit. So you can see lots of examples of things where put gets called. And not all of these are. These are producer modules. So there's an example in that sim. It's doing a simware and that puts a collection of raw digits into the event. And this was um, updated several years ago so that it uses what's called move semantics. So this way, the memory that was allocated within the producer module to make the data product that is going to be put into the art event store simply gets reassigned its ownership. Its ownership gets reassigned to art. So once the producer module is done producing it, it needs to give up uh, the ownership of the thing that produces so that art can manage it and write it to the output file. And that's done with the standard move. So that way you don't have to copy your data when you put it into the uh, data store. So the art memory store for the event data is non-writable or not overwritable. You write it with event put, but you can't change it, or at least not, uh, it's, things are declared const is the protection that's provided by the compiler. And that way we're protected from our colleagues overwriting the uh, event data. So someone may be well-meaning and want to calibrate something and they'll take some data from the input file, put it in memory and replace it with a calibrated version. But then it's very hard to tell what the data actually means because you may not be aware of whether that's raw data or calibrated data. So what we do is we make the data in the art memory uh, immutable and can't change it. If you want to calibrate something, you have to make a new copy and label it as calibrated. So the calibration module would be a producer module we call put and put a new copy of data into the um, art memory store. 
analyzer modules read this uh, data in the art event memory and produce things like histograms or t-trees. And in the section on uh, Friday, we'll talk about how to add a histogram uh, uh, to a uh, analyzer module. So these get output not to the event data file, but to the histogram output. So when Art runs a job, you usually get two kinds of output files. One is processed event data, and the other one consists of things like histograms and t-trees. And t-file service is the tool that's uh, used or the service that's used to manage the things like histograms produced in our analyzer modules. Source modules read in uh, data from the input file and put it into the event. Um, so uh, we normally use root input uh, for the input source, and then we don't have to write our own source because Art provides uh, a source that reads the input from root files. This is not going to be true for everything moving forward. So it turns out that HDF5 is gaining traction within the particle physics community. Even we've been using root files for a long time and HBook files before that. But some people are getting tired of root files, and HDF5 is a very popular outside of particle physics, and people want to uh, get some experience with it. It's also useful uh, uh, when people are writing code in Python, they like HDF5 as the format. So we are gradually making more tools for reading HDF5 files uh, into art. So a source, what it does is it copies data out of the, the root file and into memory, but some of it's delayed. So in fact, you don't even read all the data out of the input file until you need it. It stays on disk until a module asks for it by uh, get by label or get valid handle to actually retrieve the product. And we need to code some, some of that functionality, this delayed reading for HDF5, and that's coming in the future. Services are singleton classes that are globally visible. So most of these plugins are things like you want to put your own algorithm of code and read and analyze data, but services aren't doing that. They're providing things like, uh, say, the geometry or the liquid argon temperature or the drift velocity, the electric field. Th those sorts of things are common and shared among all the um, producer and analyzer modules. So if you have some configuration somewhere like the electric field, you want every module that needs to know what the electric field is to use the same configuration. You don't want to have to specify a fickle parameter for every module that needs the electric field and make sure that everyone has the same uh, choice of electric field in all of their parameters because maybe someone named them differently. So instead, it's recommended that modules call services to get things like the electric field. So anything that's shared uh, by, by module should go into um, a service. Tools are kind of like services, except they're not singletons. So it's nice to have just one electric field or one uh, configuration for all the electric fields in the detector because you want to make sure everyone has the same one. But the tool may have other functionality like doing uh, data processing uh, where you want to be able to plug in uh, uh, one set of algorithms uh, or um, plug in another one without having to rewrite your code. You might want to just be able to steer that with fickle, fickle file. So a tool is uh, has a standard um, class interface in C++, and then uh, Art is able to steer which tool gets called at a particular time by fickle parameters. And there's an Art Wiki page for describing how to how to uh, create and configure tools. So if you want to write your own plugins, um, there's a lot of boilerplate code. Uh, we can actually look at a particular, let's look at say Simware. This is a producer module. Has a lot of boilerplate stuff. It's got a lot of art includes, you need to include the data product definitions uh, yeah, data product definitions, raw, raw digits, geometry for the geometry service. Uh, these are sim channels, the data product, raw, data, raw digit is a data product, that's the output. So boilerplate things like it has to say what it produces, it has to get the configuration parameters set, um, 
there are a lot of specific things about compressing the output and uh, storing configuration in in the private section of the um, of the module. It should have a configure, or rather, in this case, it's got a constructor which calls a method called reconfigure, which only does configuration. Back in the old days, modules were allowed to be reconfigured, but it turns out it's hard to make reproducible results if you can reconfigure modules. So for the most part, modules cannot be reconfigured. This is just an internal method that has the name reconfigure. Then, um, yeah. So um, there are some uh, questions on the on the live doc, uh, can we get an example for each stage, like analyzer module, source module, services, and tools? And also another question to be able to see all of the parameters. Like, uh, is there a way to have a list of all of the parameters and their descriptions, for example? You, you can have a look on the chat for that one. Yep. Yeah. So, um, Dune TPC has examples of all of these things. I'm looking at a uh, producer module. Uh, at the moment. And uh, what you would do is you can look for analyzer. And there are a lot of fickle files that mention analyzer. So here's an example um, analyzer. neutron decay N2. So what you can do is you can do essentially the same thing here. Just look through the source code and grep for the different kinds of modules. And um, there aren't too many source modules, for instance. There's Most people just use the art supplied root input source. And the special HDF5 one is kind of new, and I wouldn't recommended as a particularly good example yet as uh, how to write sources. There are some other sources we can look for. And there are a lot of services. So let me just grab for services. They're just C++ classes. So what was the uh, what was the other question? Oh, how do, how do you find all the parameters? Yes. So normally, um, I look at fickle files to look at find parameters. So for instance, here's the signal shipping service fickle file, and it should have a list of parameters. And things like fickle dump and uh, config dumper should list parameters. This is actually a table substitution. So that's why fickle dump and config dumper are nice, because they expand all these at local tables. This may not have been a good choice because it's almost all tables. Let's do neutron decay study. And you can see parameters that are set there. But sometimes parameters have default values and you actually have to go look at the source code to find out what they're set. So sometimes they're even missing from the fickle files. And they're not in the job configuration uh, that gets saved to the output file because there's a default input and it never got read out of the input fickle file. And the art team realized that this was being too lenient on us physicists because we like convenience. And if there's a default that everyone's using and no one remembers that it's even a configurable parameter, then when you read a file, you may not know what the actual value is until you go look at this, the, the module that defined the default. And the default may change from version to version, which is why the file can get dissociated from its configuration. So that's um, why some people have added uh, uh, fickle um, uh, configuration validation to make sure that every fickle parameter is actually specified on the input, it's not required because the R team didn't want to break our old uh, workflows where default values could be specified. So the sad thing is that the definitive list of parameters for any bit of algorithm is defined in the source module, uh, in the source code of the module that needs it. So sometimes you just have to look for it and grab for it in the source tree. OK. 
Okay. If you want to make your own code, I would recommend using the skeleton generator. And CET Skeleton will make, and its help is, is badly configured because it, you get a warning that it's a binary file, but it's actually not, it's visible. So I think the problem is it's setting colors and boldface and that sort of thing. So um, this makes the uh, uh, empty uh, modules or services, depending on what you want. So uh, I would just say CT Skelgen, then the plugin type, let's say I want a producer and then give it a name, CT Skelgen producer my producer and what that will do is it will make an empty source code for a producer module and then you just fill in the blanks so that has all the boilerplate art includes it defines a empty constructor there's your constructor and it's got a produce method which is required you have to produce something um, in your uh, producer in fact, uh, you will get a crash. You'll uh, get an exception thrown from art if you don't produce what you say you produce. So a producer has to have the statement produces, which declares to art what it's going to produce. And then the produce method actually has to call event put for the data products it promises to produce. Now it can produce an empty list. So if there is no input data, or say you didn't just didn't find any tracks in this event, uh, that's okay. You just have to produce an empty uh, collection of tracks and put that into the event. So the reason for that is that root has these T trees, and each entry in the T tree has to be present in each each event. So if you've got um, tracks and clusters and raw digits, and they all have to line up for the same number of entries, so each event has an entry in each one of those branches. Uh, that means that everything that produces a product to be put on a branch has to put something there, even if it's an empty uh, container for that. So that way the tea trees uh, line up uh, or the branches line up between the, um, uh, the different parts of the tree. So that's why you have to do that. Okay, you are welcome to write non-plugin code. So just plain old C++ or even C, uh, standalone uh, methods or functions. Go ahead and put that in there. We've got some instructions on how to uh, build code uh, on Friday. Uh, you just put that in. In fact, it's recommended that um, code for Larsoft be coded up not in these uh, modules or services, but rather in stand, um, standalone standard code that your modules and services and tools can call. And the reason for that is portability, so that if we change the interface, uh, in art, and it uh, sadly changes every now and then, then your algorithm code doesn't have to be modified. And it's also a good way to separate IO and computation is that we want to be able to take your code and be able to apply it to different cases, make it more reusable and not tied to the uh, framework too tightly. So the framework likes to guide us in what we how we code everything but it also tells us don't depend on it too too closely because you may want to reuse your code for other things okay so we were looking at one of those producer modules that's in get by get by level Email consumes. No. Similar. What are we? Sim channel. This thing reads in sim channels and writes out um, uh, raw digits. So this is the produce method for a particular producer module that uh, takes Monte Carlo truth and simulates the detector in sim channels. So let's see. How do we actually get? Uh, channels. I'm just looking at this. Uh, 
produce. We should be able to get from the end of get view. So this is a somewhat unusual one. So most modules use either get by label or get valid handle. This is called get view, and it's getting a handle to the SIM channels, which are then looped over. So producer modules and analyzer modules retrieve data, and you can look for get by label, get valid handle. It turns out get by label is going to be deprecated soon. Uh, get many by type is used by the Jean Fort um, step where we look for all of the MC truths made by anybody. So get many by type says, well, find all the MC truths and I don't care who made them. So that means the argon 39, the argon 42, the cosmic rays, all of those get simulated by Jean. And we fish all of those generator uh, outputs out of the event using get many by type. So there's a lot of documentation in there for future work. Much time left? Oh, a fair amount of time. So let's actually show you, let me show you a gallery example. I got, got there too. This is a gallery script that's in the Dune TPC gallery examples directory. The gallery scripts don't need to be compiled. This one is just a root script that gets interpreted and it makes a poor man's event display of um, Proto Dune uh, uh, space points. So you may notice uh, when we uh, go through the example of how to download and build code, that it takes a long time to compile and build and it takes a bit of uh, experimentation to get it right. If you're in a hurry and you just want to look at some data without going through the uh, heavyweight framework, uh, gallery might be your tool. Well, the problem with gallery is that you don't have access to art services and things like um, getting called on sub uh, run and sub run boundaries don't happen. You just read the data out of the input file in the old um, fashioned style and you don't get art uh, scheduling of modules or anything like that. So you can essentially just write a root script that accesses data products out of an art root file. That's what gallery does. So what this does, and it's got the um, get valid handle, this is how to normally uh, retrieve data products in uh, modules that, that read data. Gallery supports that. Uh, so you can take uh, code that you've been developing in gallery and move it into art or take uh, art code that doesn't use services and move it into gallery. And what this does is it gets the space points out of the input file. There's an input file name that I have as a default parameter for the uh, argument to a, a root script. And then I look for the first event and which event I want to look at is just um, labeled by IEV count. And then um, this uh, bit of code is actually in the gallery example, so you can read it at your leisure. But what it does is it looks at space points that are from Pandora. So Pandora is one of the arguments space point tag string. It looks for all the Pandora produced space points and makes a tgraph 2D out of it and displays a tgraph 2D, which is actually a, a three-dimensional graph. You can claim root for that name. So I'm going to fire up root and let's see. And this one, it turns out it hits CVMFS pretty hard because it has to include a whole bunch of include files. And that it's not actually taking any CPU, it's just reading in a bunch of include files. And this file is located in this directory. It's the Rico, it's a protodune Rico uh, file, Rico one, it's this one here. So I'm looking at space points from a particular run, 5387, I think that might be a one GV beam run that I copied out of, out of uh, Dcache. There it is. So I could have used the XRootD uh, URL, but I have my own copy 
for that. So this is an example of something that you don't need to run art for. And if I want to change the event number, I just supply an argument for that. And I've already got it lo loaded up. And this particular example takes uh, space points that are within a cylinder of the beam axis and colors them red. There's no other um, uh, logic behind there. But this is just an example of how to look at art root files without using art. And that's called gallery. Okay, Larsoft. How much time do I have? Uh, Larsoft is a toolkit based on art, and it has um, lots of things that are defined uh, already in it. So the event data model, things like the MC truth and MC particles are data products that come in the Larsoft and new tools suite. If you have an art root file and would like to just dump some of these things to uh, uh, text um, files, um, you can go ahead and do that. So let's say dump hits. You can even explore with this file that we have. R-C dump hits. Let's just look at the first one. And uh, that's the file we were just looking at. Oops, and I think I got the wrong kind of hits. This is actually an ex uh, example of something that will happen when uh, I have to run product sizes dumper and change the hit module label. Can't find the association between raw digits and hits because we dropped the raw digits in this data file. Let's try to dump hits on one column. I think we may be dropping raw digits in my cell as well. Let's try these before. Nope, it's got the same problem. So the problem is, is that we've been dropping raw digits in the um, dump MC truth. There we go. Um, can, you, can you perhaps clarify what, what it is dropping raw digits? But those completely new to yourself. Okay. So the different data products that we have, they're actually um, a nice introduction to this is this talk here by Ting Jin. Let's go ahead and load it. This from the Protodune analysis workshop. So raw digits, these are um, raw data from the detector. We take uh, those 6,000 samples on each. Of uh, triggered readout of Protodune. And there are 15,360 channels in the detector, and each has 6,000 ADC samples. So that's a lot of data. It turns out it's like 300 megabytes of data per uh, triggered readout. And this is a display of what those waveforms look like for just one event for one TPC. That's one APA, and there are six of them in a, um, in a, uh, uh, detector. So turns out that um, art by default uh, will take the input data and copy it to the output file and then add all the things that your producers make. So if you want to reconstruct things with hits, it'll copy all the raw digits and the hits and associations between them to the output file. Problem is, is this just duplicates the raw data. We took uh, several petabytes of data from uh, uh, NPO4, and that would mean that every passive reconstruction would take between two and four petabytes of data, and that costs money, so we drop these raw digits, and we just keep the tracks and hits. And the hit dumper is apparently stupid in that it insists on associations between raw digits and hits, and we'll throw an exception if it doesn't find that. So I was able to wait, MC truth. So these are the Monte Carlo truth 
and I've got things like there's an electron, a muon, photons. These are things that are made by the um, by the generators. And it's making singles gen, so maybe the electron or the muon from the uh, generator and some of these other things might, oh, they should be, uh, why the single generators? Oh, okay, we've got Krypton 85. So we're getting electrons and photons from the um, radiological generators. So Larsoff provides definitions of raw digits. Rico B wire is um, processed versions of raw digits. So uh, uh, you get raw waveforms from the detector, which have bipolar pulses for the induction plane and unipolar pulses for the collection plane. They get calibrated, noise filtered, and decon deconvolved uh, to produce unipolar pulses on the induction planes. Hits are Gaussian fits to pulses on, on, on wires. And space points we've already looked at, there are places in space where uh, hits that are associated between views uh, could be associated. Then we have clusters of hits, particles, which could be tracks or showers. There are tracks. Calorimetry has things like charge uh, assignment, um, charge detected on each track per unit length so that you can do particle ID, tell a proton from a electron, from a muon, because they have different DD axes. Showers are mainly for electromagnetic objects, and there are other data products for things like the photon detector. So that's just a very quick uh, whip through this presentation. Please download it and uh, look at it yourself, because this describes a lot of the data products that are in Larsoft. Uh, output files. And I've already mentioned the, the workflows um, for uh, running uh, simu generation simulation, uh, detector simulation, and reconstruction. And there it is at CERN. I tested this and had to copy a file over because um, these jobs, they actually read a file off of Dcache. Uh, they don't use XRootD, they just copy it over with IFDH. And if you don't have Fermilab credentials, that will fail. So I copied it over and pointed this. This is the uh, Beamflux file for the uh, generation stage. Okay. Um, sorry, another question. <clears throat> sorry. Can you please explain uh, the deconvoluted signals? Ah, okay. So when charge arrives uh, near a wire, maybe I need to have a, a nice picture. You have a mental picture of what the APAs look like. They are planes of wires that are strung on a rectangular frame. And there are three uh, uh, sensitive planes. There's U, V, and collection. So the charges drift past the induction plane, the U and V plane wires, U and V, do not collect charge, the charge drifts past them, and then the charge lands on the collection plane wires. So the voltages on these wires are set so that the charge doesn't, uh, doesn't get attracted to the wires. They get pulled past the induction plane wires and land on the collection plane wires. So when charge is drifting past an induction plane wire, it induces a current on it because it repels the electrons in the wire, and those electrons go into amplifiers and get um, measured by ADCs. So as the charge is drifting in, the electrons get pushed away on the wire and in, into the ADCs. And when the charge keeps on moving and drifts past that wire, the electrons come back. So the current first gets pushed a, a, a positive away from um, electrons go away from the, the drifting charge, and then they get pulled back. So the Induction wire signal is this bipolar shape. You see the charge first arriving and then departing as it goes past, past the wire. So the deconvolution says, I'm going to assume a Green's function for that. I'm going to see what a single charge does as it drifts past the wire. And I'm going to assume that my response that I see on this wire is a sum over uh, lots of electrons that arrive at different times in different places. So if I have this bipolar signal that 
is in black that I detect from the detector, I can go back and infer what the true charge distribution that made it was. And this is important because, well, these hits are separated from one another so that you can see the upswing and the downswing separately for each of these hits. But sometimes if you've got two tracks that are close to one another and they cross, or they're very close to one another, the up part of one hit will cancel out the down part of the next hit, or um, the down part of one hit will cancel the up part of the next hit. And what you'll get is a suppression, and that won't be at all clear. Uh, you'll have an upswing and then nothing for a while, and then a downswing. And you have to interpret that as a whole string of hits instead of just uh, one or two hits. So that's the job of the decon deconvolution is to try to infer what the true charge arrival distribution is given the signals that we measured on our ADCs. And we do a two-dimensional deconvolution without describing how to deconvolve in time. There's also decon deconvolution in space because as charge is drifting in, it induces current on neighboring wires. It's not just the nearest wire, it's the ones nearby uh, as well. So in order to infer what the true charge arrival uh, distribution is in both time and space, we need the measurements not only on a wire, but also the neighboring wires too. More questions? Thank you, Tom. So that way we can fit Gaussians to the hits in all three planes. The collection plane is a lot simpler. Collection planes, raw signals look a lot like the deconvolved signals in the induction plane. They're just single unipolar spikes. And sometimes if a track goes parallel to the wires or parallel to the electric field, you may get, instead of a nice pulse, you may get a whole string of pulses that sort of smush into one another. And then the hit finder has to make some kind of sense out of that. And they can either fit one big broad hit or a bunch of smaller hits. And these are fickle configur uh, configurable parameters to the hit finder, whether you want a lot of little hits or one big broad hit depending on what you want to do with it. And uh, let's run the event display. Product two. Um, and uh, this is um, Monte Carlo. So I'm just going to use EVD Protodo like it says in the And since I don't have raw digits, I'm going to get an empty display because raw digits is the default for this. So there's raw is the radio button checkbox here. I'm going to click reconstructed. And it's going to draw reconstructed. And it turns out that this event display is very not smart. You have to unzoom interest in order to get the full display. And what this shows is tracks and, and unzooming interest again, we'll draw it a little better maybe. And if you want to change what's shown, let's say, oh, I want to, I'm, I'm looking at tracks, hits, and vertices. So if I turn off the hits, for instance. So the way to configure the event display is you select an option here, you delete what there was, you put in your new option, you have to press enter in order for that to change color from this yellow to black, and you press apply, and then that will redraw it. And oh, this is so stupid, you have to press on zoom interest. Not very good. So what that did is I turned off the hits, and that made the um, display a little bit clearer. You can see some Rico B wire. If I click on a place in the event display, anywhere in here, I get waveforms down below. And these waveforms show uh, the hits that are found. And some of them are a little ugly like this one, and let's unzoom with the right mouse button. And some of these, 
you can zoom in. Those are those are the hits. Actually, I think I don't even have the recombi wires. I don't see the waveform, so I just see the hits. But maybe let's see if I can draw wires. Do I have wires? So that's one thing that um, uh, is a running gag in Larsoft is that some things are poorly named. And one of the poor names is wire. So wire in this case does not mean um, metal wires in the detector. It means the calibrated deconvolved waveforms. Where is draw wires? Do we have a hand drawer? Wire drawer. Yeah, we got wire, wire module labels. And is there draw wires? Go vertices. I think it draws wires by default. So I probably just don't have recombi wires in this. I think we we deleted them. Draw all wires. No. So we're getting tracks, vertices, clusters. It's in this. There are um, different TPCs in this. This is TPC1, that's for APA3. I should show you whether we're to find the geometry information. So let's go to Dune TPC in Redmine. And the wiki has the geometry. Where is the geometry? Geometries. And this is a uh, protodune single phase file. So the this is the numbering of the TPCs. A TPC uh, in offline speak is a drift volume uh, seen by an APA on one side. So there are six APAs in protodune, and TPC one is seen by this APA in the upstream. The beam comes in from the left. This is a cathode in the middle, and the beam comes in on this side near the API on the bottom. So TPC1, we're looking at the beam uh, side. This is collection, that's V and that's U. We're looking at data that's collected in this drift volume. TPC2 is this other APA over here, TPC three, actually TPC zero and three are special because Protodune is an interesting detector because the cryostat wraps around this whole thing. This is liquid argon in TPCs one, five, and nine, two, six, and 10. This side, three, seven, and 11, and zero, four, and eight are on the cryostat side. There is a metal cryostat just a few inches away from the APA, it's grounded. And in fact, electrons do not drift towards the APA, they drift away from it. So you should not see signals on the uh, in TPC0. And in fact, we do not. We unzoom the interest. We actually see things in the adduction plane. Um, I don't know how they're drawn because the wires wrap around and the TPC0 induction wires are actually TPC1 induction wires. They're the same wires, they just wrap around from the back side to the front side. But the collection wires are shared are not shared between the uh, front and back of the APA. We do see a little bit of signal on this cryostat side here because the tracks that punch through the APA do leave hits within the wire planes. So the fields between grid U and V do let electrons drift towards the collection wires uh, on that side. But if you're outside the grid, uh, then the charge doesn't even separate um, from the ionization point and, and drift in the right direction. The field is too small and it points in the wrong direction. So I shouldn't see any signal uh, on the collection plane on the cryostat side. So one should have some signals and two, five, and six. Maybe six was one of my favorites. That was run up by Felix. And we always have to unzoom the interest to see things. 